Uh, this probably knows recording good. Okay. Um, Sorry. We have a, oh, that's okay. That's okay. Um, so we have we have a, a, a land acknowledgement that we've hammered out recently, um, and I, I do my best to read them at all the events that I can when I'm on the Hayward um, or Concord campuses. So, as a member of the Cal State East Bay community with an office on the Hayward campus, I acknowledge that I'm a guest on the unceded land of the first people of this region, the present-day Muekla Ohlone tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area formerly the Verona Band of Alameda County. I support the sovereignty of this Chichenyo Ohlone speaking tribal group and other indigenous uh, peoples. And if you wanna learn more about our land acknowledgement, land acknowledgement process, um, please let me know because we have a much longer one that we use uh, for uh, um, internally um, also. All right. Okay, so now let's talk about uh, New Mexico. Sorry to take you from, we're gonna, we're gonna travel a little bit in time and in space uh, to get to the early mid 19th century uh, New Mexico, a site called Turley's Mill and Distillery. Um, so the site that you see in front of you, let me put my pointer on here, a laser pointer. The site that you see in front of you on the right um, is, uh, is a mill distillery complex, so a grist mill um, and whiskey distillery complex. And I think at least probably 16 or 17 other functions uh, took place there, not all of them related to milling um, and distilling. And if you include oral histories um, in the number, it's probably a little bit closer to 20 or 21 different operations. Um, and if you think, how can that fit in this, uh, in this structure? Let me give you a sense for size. From this end, from this whiskey bottle to uh, the far end on the right here, that's about 135 uh, meters, maybe a little bit more, give or take um, a few meters. So it's pretty enormous, right? Um, and it was at least a two-story structure. It's very likely that in the, the milling industrial portions of the structure, that it's as many as three or four narrow um, stories. So one of the largest structures in Northern New Mexico um, at the time, for decades before and decades after, um, it, one of the largest, so an enormous uh, uh, structure. This picture was taken in the 1920s, and so a lot of the, the second story had collapsed. There's not much second story left at all now. It's larger than stone masonry uh, first story, right? And these stones are big, right? Um, big, well, you can't see my monitor in front of me, but big is my monitor in front of me, probably as big as your monitor um, at home. Enormous uh, stones, it's just a huge site. The walls are over a meter thick, and that is without the exterior and interior plaster that it used to have over, right? Because the stone masonry wall supported enormous um, uh, adobe walls on top of it. You see the map there. And this is roughly where it's at um, in the Taos uh, area, in an area called Oriol Hondo, for those of you who are familiar um, with Taos. For those of you who are not, this is about an hour and 20 minutes north uh, drive wise of uh, Santa Fe. So it's a site here on the right, built 1831, destroyed in 1847, but on the left, these are the people who destroyed it, right? Um, as uh, Patricia mentioned, there was a coalition of, uh, of Hispanos, or I'm gonna go in various terms here, right? Hispanos and indigenous uh, folks, who co uh, a coalition um, who destroyed about 500 uh, people, right? By, uh, by rifle shot, by arrow, and by fire, right? Laying siege to it for two days and killing nearly everyone inside. Uh, the big question here is why that happened. And that's been the big historical question for some time, except the problem has been that historians in the mid, mid 20th century, that's really the only historians who've worked on these questions, um, had thoroughly, thoroughly racist um, and stereotyping reasons for their answers to why um, they destroyed the mill. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, real quick, just a fun note, this uh, whiskey that they produce here is called Taos Lightning. But there is a, a micro distiller, KGB uh, distillery, Give them a plug. I don't know anyone there, to be clear. I don't make any money off of this, but their whiskey is delicious. Their Taos Lightning is delicious. But the problem is, is that um, the whiskey at uh, Turley's Mill would have been comparatively disgusting. So um, I can't say it's a proper formula. It's the right formula. It's, it's very doubtful um, that Turley stuff aged even more than a few weeks, right? It was likely about as close to actual poison um, as a whiskey could get. That's the word anyway. It supposedly had an enormous kick. And to add a little kick to it, they would add some chili powder. That's that's the way the oral tradition goes. I'm not sure if that part's true, but here's something to divide up this talk, kind of an overview of things. I'm going to tell you the story of Turley's Mill. There are actually parallel stories here, multiple stories. Um, there's, there's a story that's told that among the native folks of Taos Pueblo. Um, there's a story that's told popularly among uh, the historian and kind of uh, an in-between version that exists among these kind of sort of Mexican population uh, there today. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the historiography, the, the historians, mid 20th century historians who are cool on this case, um, on this, are totally bewildered, just befuddled as to why 
um, Turley's Mill was uh, attacked by these uh, rebels, um, and they've come to the conclusion it's because they are um, disloyal Mexicans and drunk Indians, right, after whiskey. And that's, that's, that's their logic behind it. Um, their version of the story. So they're bewildered as to why this could possibly happen. And I'd like to, to unbefuddle this or de-bewilder this. I'm not sure there's a term uh, that's right for it, but uh, demystified just doesn't seem uh, strong enough, right? That's one of the aims of this research. And I want to reboot the question altogether. I'm going to start with why did they choose to destroy this mill, but from the ground up. Sometimes for those of you budding historians out there, um, I'm also a historian in, in addition to being an archaeologist, Sometimes we have to take this story, the historiography, really read it carefully, thoroughly, and toss it in the garbage. Sometimes that's required in order to do a proper review um, of the evidence. Set it aside. We're going to set that history of our historiography entirely aside today. I'll talk a little bit about the coming NSF-funded research. I've been working at the site for almost 15 years now with my dissertation uh, site. It's an enormous site, as I said. I can't say the word enormous enough. Um, on this, and it's hard to get to anything here in terms of excavation. It's very expensive to get to anything here. And without this NSF, I'm not sure what more I would have been able to do because it's just so hard to operate on the site. So we'll talk a little bit about my actual research questions after I reboot the primary question um, and the research that's to come. And then we'll make the Santa Cruz uh, connection in terms of uh, Joe Guy and the kind of information that I'm looking for and that I'm hoping that uh, some members of the Santa Cruz Archaeological Society and other folks that just live in Santa Cruz Especially if you live in Scotts Valley, Felton um, area, I would love to know, uh, you know, what hints and leads you have to provide me um, on this. Okay, so the story of Turley's Mill. So I'll tell you a little bit about Turley first. Turley was not a mountain man, but he was swimming in mountain men. When I say mountain men, it's exactly the stereotype that you think for the most part, right? Print buckskin, fringe, um, you know, shooting every animal that they see, right? Collecting every pelt and hide and boom that they could find, you know, around them. Exactly that. They, they are so near to filling the stereotype, it's just kind of silly almost. Um, Turley was not a mountain man though. He was surrounded uh, by mountain men. He's from Kentucky originally, um, lived part of his adult life in Missouri and then ended up in Taos. An important thing to remember, the reason he's not a mountain man is because he couldn't carry out those activities. He might've dressed like them, he might've smelled like them, he might've drank like them, but he didn't work like them because he was disabled, right? Uh, they called him uh, called it crippled in one knee, but he effectively couldn't walk, and he needed appliances basically to walk anywhere, right? So he could he had a hard time making it from point A to point B. So he needed to be somewhere where he could work locally. So it's clear to me that when he left uh, Missouri to get over the Santa Fe Trail to Taos, that he had a distillery, mill distillery complex in mind. I'm not certain there's much else that he would be he would have been had the capacity to do um, at that time. But he was surrounded, as I mentioned. Um, an American mountain man who were many of them were working their way into Mexican New Mexico at the time, but still hadn't turned over to American hands. Now, everyday life at Turley's Mill, well, before I get to that, this is one of those mountain men, this is not Turley. There's no images, there's no photos or images of Turley. He didn't live long enough to make it to the photograph um, as uh, <laughs> connected to the camera, right? Um, as this guy did, his name is Tom Tobin. He, knew, he lived a nice, long um, life, uh, but uh, he's one of the very few survivors. Um, of uh, the siege of Turley's Mill. Everyday life at Turley's Mill, as far as we can tell, um, seems to have gone something like this. There's a large body, at least compared to most of the oper most work operations going on in the Taos area, a large body of Mexican and Indian laborers above which sat a uh, um, uh, hier hierarchical sort of rung of uh, mountain men and then Turley at the top. Mountain men managing the distillery, managing the grist mill and so on. Between the, the oral histories and the documents, that's somewhere in the neighborhood um, of where we're at in terms of everyday life at Turley's Mill. Running distillery operations, grist milling operations, possibly managing sheep herding operations, hog farming operations, and another probably 15 or 18 um, items down that list. Turley was one of the most efficient capitalists I know of for the period, including even uh, the, the, the captains of industry in the American East. If, if you don't believe it yet, you will by the time I'm done with this, uh, uh, with this talk. Now, between 1846 and 1847, the Mexican-American War rages, and that's when the United States come in and force, comes in and forcibly annexes the American Southwest between New Mexico um, and California. What most people don't know about is that in northern New Mexico, centered in Taos, there's a rebellion, a substantial, significant rebellion against American occupation, initially involving about 2,000 people, right? So, that, so it's said, between 1,500 and 2,000. People. Those numbers seem a little bit big to me, but I'll go with the conventional story. 
um, as it is. And the first act of that was rebellion is that that group killed the American found and killed the American appointed governor, a guy named Bent, in the town of Taos, because Bent lived in Taos. And then 500 of them peeled off from the town of Taos and went about 13 miles north to the village, to the land grant of Arroyo Hondo, passing up multiple whiskey distilleries on the way just to attack Turley's Mill and Distillery, the single largest industrial installation in all of the Southwest at the time, right? We should think about the fact that they passed up several distilleries on their way there. Not only that, but in the estate sale that followed, because there was an estate sale, there was tons of stuff they left behind. So if they wanted to loot, if they wanted the whiskey, they were the world history's worst looters. For whatever reason, they left a lot behind. And being so many there, it seems unlikely that their effort was a looting effort, that they were a mob in the truest sense of the term. So they destroyed Turley's Mill, laid siege to it, as I mentioned, for two days, lit the place on fire, killed everyone inside except for the three that escaped, one of them being Turley, one of them being the fellow on the left here. Um, but uh, Turley didn't make it. Turley, Turley made it out uh, within a mile of the mill. Again, he was disabled. It was very hard for him to get from point A to point B, right? Um, and he was, he was found by a Mexican friend of his. Um, he offered his friend uh, something valuable. The story goes his watch, his gold watch or something like that, right? Something valuable in exchange for saving him. And he said, well, I'll be right back, amigo, right? And he comes back with the cavalry and they kill Turley on the spot. There's a mass grave in the town of Taos in the Kit Carson uh, Cemetery uh, where their bodies are all buried um, together, right? All those folks. So it was, uh, it was quite a scene, quite a scene. Um, now, there's an alternate version of this story that was uh, published by a friend of mine at Taos Pueblo, indigenous person at Taos Pueblo, a Taos Indian named John Suazo. Um, John Suazo published it in a now, now defunct uh, newspaper called the Taos Horsefly, and he called it a lesson for gringos, right? So if you're interested in a, if you're interested in a lesson for gringos, here it goes. Um, this, this version of the story goes that the natives of Taos Pueblo left the Pueblo on their own without conspiring alongside uh, um, any Mexican parties and went to Turley's Mill right away, walked into Turley's storehouse, right, where he, where he had all his goods, right, his trade goods. Um, and Turley was there and just let them take whatever they want so that, you know, out of fear that they would kill him. In the end, there was one sort of pothead who, who shot an arrow at Turley, nailed him, and then he was, full, he was filled full of arrows before everyone left. That's the version that, uh, that uh, John tells me is told um, at Taos Pueblo. Keep in mind, of course, that Taos Pueblo is uh, um, um, famous for their silence on oral tradition. So he's the only person that I have the story from. Um, he published it, but it's not corroborated by anyone else. I just think it's interesting that there are parallel sort of uh, narratives here, right? Um, whatever the case, my research questions get at all versions of the story one way or another, right? Now about this bewildered historiography, so Turley has, has a reputation for, for kindness, right? Um, and this is historically documented. I'm not sure how, how you know, I'm not sure the veracity of the documents, but, but fine, there's a reputation for kindness that if someone locally needed groceries, if they needed, you know, uh, financial help, if they needed, uh, um, you know, whatever sort of hot meal, you know, um, if there are people coming in from out of town, they need a place to stay, Turley would let them stay there, often at no cost uh, to them. He had a reputation for kindness. So these historians in the mid 20th century were entirely confused as to how Mexicans and native folks could be so disloyal to Turley, right? Um, presumably being paid uh, well. We don't know that they were remunerated well, but it's said um, that they were. So they come up with the idea that, well, these, of course, the conspiring Mexicans, that's what they do, right? Um, you know, Turley brought jobs. Literally, I've talked to folks who fully believe that Turley brought jobs into the Taos Valley, and they should have been uh, more, <laughs> they should have been more grateful, right, um, is what some folks have told me and what I've read. In fact, one of the historical observers, a man named Ruxton, a Brit named Ruxton, who happened to be visiting days before the rebellion, um, literally called it, literally said, such is Mexican gratitude in terms of the disloyalty that led to this uh, rebellion. And that clearly the native folks just wanted whiskey, right? Um, and that's why that's why they pulled it off. One historian literally said they were looking for a boost in liquid courage, right? So that, that, that's the idea. Now I'd like to abandon that stuff. My research questions that I mentioned, as I mentioned, are, are uh, represent an unbefuddling, um, a de bewilderment of this, because I think it's, you know, these historians of law are long past. So I'm a little bit safe in saying this is just ridiculous. It's nuts, right? I have stronger words for it, but we're being reported right now. So I'll start over with that question. Why did the rebels choose Turley's Mill? Reboot it all together, right? 
I set aside the great men histories. Turley was a great man. Why couldn't they just respect it? I set aside the racist stereotypes and I do the science, right? This is not how science is built, but racist stereotypes and great man histories. I asked the question, what changed on Turley's arrival? Keep in mind, there are no major industrial installations anywhere in the region, right? No one has, has industrial installations of this size in any social memory. It doesn't exist in Taos, right? They're unfamiliar. This is the industrial revolution arriving in Taos, something historians have entirely um, ignored, right? So it changed. The industrial revolution paid a visit, right, um, to uh, uh, the Taos Valley. Patterns of human and natural resource use changed. The nature of work and time changed. Now, I know that last part of that last portion of the sentence is not mystical, magical, but um, this is something that we can quantify, right? Um, it's important. So, and I'll, I'll get to that quantification piece uh, four or five slides uh, from now, but I want you to think in terms of uh, four different uh, sets of terms. Construction, right? The construction labor required to build Turley's mill would have been practically unheard of for the time, right? The only time in the Taos Valley people get that many people together is to build a church, and the churches aren't even this big, right? Not by a long shot, right? So construction is possibly disruptive, likely disruptive. Industrial time comes in for the first time, right? Until then, there's no five o'clock whistle that, that doesn't exist um, at this point, right? These are craft laborers and farmers largely, right? They lead a very, in terms of, in terms of their, their day, right? It's not divided up like ours is. It's a foreign world um, compared to our own today, right? Like I said, the five o'clock whistle doesn't exist. They don't have to work within certain times. If you're a craft producer producing ceramics, for example, you can pretty much produce when it makes sense uh, for you to produce and not when it doesn't make sense. Industrial time is different. Whiskey distilleries, grist mills require work at set hours of the day, right? And that's something that, uh, that didn't quite exist um, before the nature of work changes. For example, it's well documented in the American Northeast when the, when the Industrial Revolution arrives that people were frustrated. Workers were frustrated because they, they couldn't drink at work, right? We see letters from Turley to his brother in St. Louis saying, please send me a silver person to run this damn distillery, right? So it's a similar sort of situation we can assume anyway um, in the Southwest at the time. Things are changing. The industrial writing might be on the wall, right? Resource use. Now, there's probably, I think it's safe to say that there's, there's, a, there's a fair chance, right, that Turley is using more in the way of resources, especially wood and water, in this operation and probably producing a fair bit more waste than most people in Taos Valley. It's one of the things that I'm trying to determine. I'll get to the specific research questions that, that surround this in a moment. I want to introduce you to the site more closely uh, now. Okay, so as I mentioned, it's huge. Can't say enormous enough times. Dimensions 135 by 50 meters. That is, if, if you're not familiar with the metric system, um, that is larger than the size of a standard American football field. It's, it's, it's pretty big, right? Excavating this thing is like excavating a Walmart or something, right? It's that big. Um, and only the first story, as I mentioned, remains. Something I don't think that I mentioned is that the first story is now full of the adobe melt and, and crash uh, from all those huge uh, second story walls that came down, right? So imagine each of these walls are a meter thick. If four of them comes down, how many meters are between you and the archaeological sweet spot as an archaeologist? As many as four, right? So our, our our excavation strategy here has to be to follow the looters because the looters have already done three quarters of the digging for us, right? And so what we want to get to is the floor of the structure or one of the floors because there are multiple and the looters often didn't make it all the way down. So we take advantage of their of looters pits and of the natural dips that are built into the kind of uh, ruined landscape uh, as it is. Now, there's a notable charcoal laden area. And so the, you see that the way the cameras, the camera angle is here, right, that I provided for you. You see that, that uh, in the, hopefully you can read this, right? It says charcoal laden area, feature 22. That's the direction of the camera. That's what we see in this picture here. Um, that's my former student, Paco, who's uh, helping me excavate. You can see a checkerboard pattern of excavation there in the charcoal laden area. There is so much charcoal in this earth that when you dig down on the ground, we dug as much as, you know, as much as a couple meters um, in there at certain points. You dig down on the ground, you tap the walls. It's scary, honestly. You tap the walls um, of your excavation unit there's so much charcoal, it sounds hollow, right? It doesn't feel like solid clay, it doesn't feel like solid earth. It can be a scary place to be. Um, clearly, we've, uh, we've suspended excavations in that area um, as a result, right? Until we can figure out, bring, bring equipment in to shore up those walls in order to continue there. Whatever the case, we find a lot of great information there. Take a look at that 
the ring around it, the yellow brown ring around it, we defoliated that thing entirely there, right? That is not, that's not a, a yellow grass, that's dirt, right? So it goes from black, charcoal black, stained earth and charcoal, right? To uh, a 10 yr 43 for those of you professional archeologists out there, to something much lighter and then work our way into the grass where you can't really see it. Um, any longer. So there's this charcoal laden area that we need to think about. At first, I thought that it might be a place where they actually made charcoal, right? Like a charcoal pit. Uh, I'm not certain that would be the case because it's kind of within a part of the structure here. Be a little bit too smoky. Not impossible, but be a little bit too smoky for day-to-day -to -day operations to take place. I might be wrong though. Um, so the, the rooms of the West Wing are really large. I want to try to help characterize this, this, these spaces for you a little bit, right? You see the camera angle here. It's on room one there, which I have listed as R1, right? And this is what room one looks like. So between this point, hopefully you can see this PowerPoint uh, um, uh, red pointer, laser pointer here. From this point, right, to right about here, right, that's about 13 and a half meters, so about 14 meters, something like that. It's a pretty long, it's a pretty big room. Honestly, uh, it's, it's, it's only a little bit smaller than my wife and I's apartment in Oakland. My wife and my apartment in Oakland <laughs> that we lived in with a kid, you know, so it's, it's a pretty big uh, uh, sort of space. The apartment was small. Um, though. Okay, so that's room one. Now, I want to give you a sense for uh, the, the east wing. So the west wing, big, spacious rooms, right? Uh, this, this southern portion here on the on the west wing kind of doesn't really form full rooms. It kind of ends up in the real hondo. You think water might have spilled out to there and waste might have spilled out to there. Um, east wing is different. It's very busy and you can't see much of it. You can see some of the walls above the ground, but you can't see much because it's loaded with adobe. You see here, this mound, that's the east wing. You see right here is room three. And let me put my labels on there to help you out. So we're inside feature 18 right now with the camera, right? Right here. That's room three. That's the northern wall of room three, right? This is most of the east wing in this huge mound. And if you're standing here in feature 18, the top of this mound, depending on where, where you're at in the mound, probably around 14 or so feet above your above your feet here in feature 18. So it's a substantial uh, mound. It's not small at all. Um, and so this is the, uh, the wall of room three, the long wall of room three, right here. And that's pretty much the extent of the east wing. What you see in this picture, though, probably only goes out here. So again, enormous, enormous, enormous. It's a really big um, space. A lot of slides just to really kind of tell you that. So I want you to have a look at the excavation loci um, uh, where we placed our excavation unit. And you'll see that it's, it's kind of sad because this is, uh, you know, overall, it's a lot of summers of work, it's a lot of summers. Um, of work, but we just don't, we haven't eaten that much of the site at all. Uh, like I said, um, in uh, room one here, we had to go through, even in a, in a looter's pit, it was clearly a looter's pit, we had to go through a couple meters worth of overburden. Here we went through three meters of overburden here on the, east, on the east wing where it's totally full, right? A lot less overburden here. We got to get sweet spots here um, a little more often. There's just less stuff. It's just a lower yield in terms um, of artifacts. There's a couple of units that were architectural and geoarchaeological. We we're really just looking at architecture. We didn't give all that much in terms of artifacts, but did give us some interesting information um, about the way the structure is built. Okay, so getting to these research questions, right? Defining them a little bit. So this is the kind of simple version. I promise I, I'll do my best not to confuse anyone. I have three research questions that are built around this question of why uh, the rebels chose to release mill. Construction and personalities. If I can get to construction and person hours, I can say something about whether or not that construction of this building, right, these buildings were disruptive in terms of the labor market, in terms of labor generally, right? Did it disrupt family lives, right? Did it, and maybe even more importantly, did it, did it piss off some of the patrones, the ricos, the rich folks out there who relied on that same labor to do their own work, right? What, what happens to the farm labor, right? What happens to the craft laborers when they're stolen away for a year's worth of uh, construction? I want to get at the number of people involved in day-to-day -day operations uh, personnel. So this is this is a different approach to the question, right? Very different uh, than the construction approach. What I consider the day-to-day -day operations personnel, Mexican and native, right, is nodes in what I call the chisme network. If those of you who speak Spanish, you know what the word chisme means. It means gossip, right? Nodes in the chisme network. Remember, their nature of work is changing. Industrial time is dumped over you like a weighted blanket, right? These are things that you go home and talk about. These are the things that you talk to your parents about, your family about, you talk to your kids about, you talk to your friends about, the Chisme Network. Now, if you're unfamiliar, as my students have informed me, Chisme is now called the T, 
right? So it, it's also the T network, right? How many people become aware of the coming changes, right? Uh, due to Turley's Mill, the arrival of Americas and Turley's Mill as a result of the people that work there. If there's five uh, uh, indigenous and, and Mexican folks working there, maybe not many. If there's 50, that's a different matter in a valley where the total population for the entire valley is 2,000. That's a very different matter in terms of the social network. So there's a, there's a, there's a nice potential social network analysis that can be carried out here, right? And then finally, I want to get a sense for the volume of use of the wooden water. How much wood did they take through this? ran through this place? How much water literally uh, ran through this place, right? And did he go beyond his fair share? Now, what does that mean? Now, California folks who are familiar with California land grant history tend not to be familiar with the, with the, the Aikido grant, the Aikido land grant. There weren't that many of them in California. I'm not sure if there are any. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not really a California historian. I just pretend to be one. But uh, in New Mexico, there are a number of land grants called Aikido grants. Now, these are effectively squatters grants. What that means, and they're encouraged, right? These are these are royal era, uh, colonial, Spanish colonial era grants. <clears throat> they were encouraged by authorities. So basically, um, a number of families would go out to an area that was prior um, uh, unsettled by colonial, uh, uncolonized, right? And they would do sort of double duty out there, right? They'd make the land productive, and they'd also protect it from largely a Comanche and occasionally Apache threat, right? And if you're there for 10 years and you're successful, everyone's not killed and you're able to actually farm something, uh, then you put in a petition for a land grant, an ejido. Now, an ejido is different, as I mentioned, from the grants given to the rich, the, the rich and famous, right? The rich and famous own the grant, they own everything on it. If you want access, you've got to pay, pay to play, right? Ejidos are different. Ejidos are, oh, my phone is, sorry. Oh, I got an amber alert. That's what it is. I've got to turn it off <laughs> for this. Um, in any case, what y'all pay attention to that Amber Alert though, those things are important. Forgive me, I don't know. I'll keep going with my talk. It's recorded. You can always catch up later. Um, so uh, and on the Higos, every bit of wood, water, and any other resource that's from the land, from the commons, right? The, every family is entitled to equal, equal share, right? Turley settled on an ejido. Turley's mill is on an ejido grant, right? So I don't know how he bought in, but he bought in, right? Once he's in though, there are rules. And Turley might not have been as familiar as he should have been with those rules, or maybe he just didn't care about them at all. Now, is that enough to frustrate people to the point where they want to destroy his mill? I don't know. I think it's worth asking the question though, right? Now, so the question really is, was the, between these three, is, was the industrial writing on the wall? And there are ways to measure this, right? There are ways to calculate discontent. Okay. So what does the archaeology tell us in reference to these questions so far? The archaeology I've carried out by excavation. Look, disclaimer, disclosure, right? That you've seen how much we've excavated. It's deep, but it's not much in terms of the whole site. In terms of horizontal ex excavation, it's hard to say that we even did that, right? What we did is, is really glorified tests, right? So we have what we have as a result, but what we have is important and interesting, right? So let's talk first, let's talk in, in terms of uh, object classes that are relevant to the questions. So metals, for example, metals are a beautiful part of this um, process. And across the site, our various uh, 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 excavations on the site, we have different frequencies of metals that appear, but the highest by far, the highest proportion of it um, is in room one. But we have a huge frequency of metals and a huge vari variation in types of metals. Here's some examples of the metals that we find, of course, lots of nails, tons of nails, right? Um, rifle balls appear here and there, not as many as you think, frankly, considering that there was a, uh, uh, so they, 500 people laid siege to the place for two days. I'd expect to find more, but you know, that's just me. Um, and big metal parts, big iron parts. We'll talk about this monster. Uh, have a look at my, uh, at my, at the camera of me, uh, if you're not already. We'll talk about this mon monster and its siblings um, in a moment. What you see on screen is one of its uh, siblings, these big iron parts. They're diagnostic in a way in terms of telling us what functions are present. Um, at this site, what operations or, or enterprises are present at this site, and maybe how many people it took to run them, right? Let's focus on room one, though. Metals in room one. I'm a big fan of room one. Room one has yielded some really interesting results. I'm sure you'll be a big fan of room one after this, too. Now, you can see the variation in, uh, um, in uh, metals that we found there, right? Not a huge number of metals, but, but great variety. And what you see here on screen is something that I think is probably a millstone line. Right, that's what they call it. It's called either R, either R I N D or R Y N D if you wanted to, to Google that. Right, you can see how large it is. Um, 
on screen as it was in my hands. And if you don't know what a millstone rind is, this is what a millstone typically looks like. And there'd be two, one right on top of another. You'd drop the grain, right, right through it, and it would just kind of mash it all up, right? Smash it all up and create a nice little flower. And we'd be escaping by these uh, little divots that are cut into the, for the millstone, depending on the type of millstone. The rind is what makes that thing turn, right? So I think what we have here is a millstone rind, and we have two other pieces that are very similar to it. Actually, the broken um, pieces. Not only do we have these three, but what's really interesting about them is that they appear to have the same, represent the same breakage pattern. This piece pops off. So I have one of these and I've got two of these. They don't fit each other. So there's at least three of these, right? There's a minimum number of these rhymes and that's three, which is pretty great, pretty interesting. But once we get it a little more deeply into the material science of it, right? Uh, which I'm so glad I'm working with Junson Sari at Berkeley on this. He's my co-PI on this because um, he is an engineer. And so he can really help me with some of these things. I'm, I'm a little lost when it comes to this, but uh, we can get a sense for torque. We can get a sense for how much energy went into that turn to cause that breakage pattern. It seems to be the most common breakage pattern they have for their rinds or whatever um, this object represents, right? Can that say something about the pounds of weight that are being, that are being applied? Can that say something about the size of the machinery that it's attached to? And most importantly, can that say something about the number of people it took to operate it? Which is, of course, the main question that I'm getting at. Yeah, um, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, wood, right? Charcoal, partially burned wood, and unburned wood. Those are the, the sort of general classification um, that I've given it. I don't want to talk to, to, there's a lot of numbers on the screen, and I don't want to confuse anyone. I don't want to get myself lost in it. I want you to focus on the charcoal laden area here. That's locus A. And note that proportionally and numerically, it's the largest number of charcoal fragments we pulled um, out of the ground. And I promise you, this is before we, we took them from, <laughs> from New Mexico to Dallas and, and uh, to California, because the count is definitely higher now, probably substantially. This is a fresh count uh, from the field. Much of this even found uh, sort of in situ. Uh, pretty huge, proportionally different. Now, another piece here is slag. The slag is the residue that's left over, excuse me, left over from blacksmith, right? So this should give us some hint as to what might be going on in Locus A. Maybe it's not so much charcoal burning as it might be a blacksmith's forge. Now, something important to remember here too, is that to note here is that we have probably the highest proportion of the relative proportion of burn adobe in the same spot too, right? Which makes sense. It's a charcoal laden area, it's burned to hell, um, right? So it makes sense that that would be the case. Um, and then in addition, at some point in the 1940s, might have been the 1950s, Someone found a bellows there, and that's that's a definite, certain component um, of a blacksmith um, operation. Unless somebody used it, they really need to cool themselves badly. The towel summer could be could be brutal, so maybe that's the case. But I doubt it. I strongly suspect that there's a blacksmith's forge either here or operating in relation to Mercosa or uh, the charcoal lady area. I think that's that's very likely. Maybe even beyond uh, just likely, right? Yeah. Jump back to room one for a second. Like I promised. It's full of really cool surprises. Um, and uh, uh, so you know that there's a huge variety of metals there, maybe a metal staging area, maybe for the blacksmith, right? Um, but also we see clothing, almost the only bits of clothing that we find on the site, right? From, you can't see the perforated shoe leather here, but we have some great perforated shoe leather that we found there. And also kind of slew of buttons of various types from uh, pearl or shell to, uh, to uh, metal and, and bone, right? Now, in addition to that, we have this enigmatic, really cool piece that um, I like calling a personal indulgence because I feel fairly certain at this point that this ceramic, um, this worked ceramic, it's been rubbed on all sides, um, at least the sides that we can still see. This is this is one, you know, one side of it, that's the other side of it, right? Um, I think it's either a gaming piece, some kind of token, um, or, or if you take a look at this little inside bit here, right? It looks like it was circular at one point when it had its other half. Maybe it's a domino, I don't know. Right, it, it's it, it's unlikely it's a domino, but I like to call it um, the domino. I don't I don't I don't write that into my reports, but I like to call it the domino. Something in me tells me that it is, but we'll see. Okay, so let's let's talk hogs now. Let's talk pigs. I'm probably surprising you with this pig bit. I may have mentioned at the start of the the, uh, the talk that uh, I want you to first before you focus in on all these pig 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 logos or pig uh, symbols, right? I want you to put your attention on this bar chart, right? Uh, those of you who've ever worked in New Mexico or are familiar with New Mexico, I saw a couple of New Mexico folks or folks who worked in New Mexico on the, on the roster here. So I know some of you are out here. You'll recognize this middle finger pattern, right? The middle finger being sheep and goat, right? Which is probably mostly sheep because 
New, Northern New Mexico was inundated with sheep at this time. It's one of the primary um, sort of economic operations out there. So no one should be surprised if she sees sheep on the list and seeing this much sheep, there's not, there's not many fragments of bone that we found anyway. It's very few. Total of 80 fragments of bone we found at the site. Not many at all so far. But of those, we shouldn't be surprised to see sheep goat um, in the lead. That's just normal. This is the middle finger pattern is the normal pattern um, for Northern New Mexico for this period. However, what is different is pig. Most of you probably don't know this, but as far as anyone knows, there are no other hogs anywhere in the Taos Valley and anywhere else in northern New Mexico. They just didn't raise them there. Now, why would Turley have them? Why would he go through the trouble of bringing a squealing pig over the Santa Fe Trail, right? I, I feel like that's, that's almost the only way this could have happened, right? Now, those of you who know distillery and distillery archaeology or distillery history know well that back east, many, even most distilleries, had hogs, raised hogs, big fat hogs, because they fatten them up on the spent grain. Once you're done with the distilling process, you're left with all this crap grain that no people can consume, nobody wants to consume, and even your horses like like ball cat, you know. But pigs, oh, they'll eat it. I mean, goats are cool with it too, but pig, pigs will eat the hell out of that. No fatten up on that, right? It's a good thing. So we know that Turley had hogs because it's documented in, in uh, um, it's historically documented. But until now, there's no, until this research, there's never been any confirmation archaeologically. I was really happy to see that uh, confirmed. This, this expands the number of industries that he must have had. We see documentation of people eating pork with their Mexican dishes, pork and bacon with their Mexican dishes, right? Sort of mixed in, like fusion cuisine, right, of, 18, of the 1830s. Um, and it, not only at Turley's Mill, but also other parts of uh, nearby uh, Taos Valley clearly supplied, most likely supplied um, by Turley's Mill. So that, that indicates that his hog farming operation likely has at least a light pork packing operation, right? You can't just, you know, you can't just leave the meat out. You got to salt the stuff. Otherwise, it's not going to last very long at all. I mean, pork, um, after all. So really, really sort of exciting uh, research. Ignore that number of rodents. We have a lot of, a lot of rodents buried through the site. Probably most of those are 15 years old. Uh, okay. So what do we know? What does this tell us more generally in a nutshell? The West Wing, big rooms, blacksmithing, maybe charcoal staging. What I mean by charcoal staging is that there's, there's charcoal there. If there's, say, distilling operations nearby, they're probably staging that charcoal in order to feed the distilling operation. That's very common uh, among distilleries from the American East all the way to, to Europe, right? So blacksmithing, possible charcoal staging, metal staging, a work area, workshop type area, right? and possibly an industrial household, considering the indulgences, considering uh, the clothing items, not impossible, uh, maybe even likely. East Wing, we have no idea. Uh, we excavated there, it was very painful, physically painful to excavate there. Um, trust me, some of you might be in the room who've done it with me there. Um, and uh, we, we really know nothing about that, <laughs> despite all that work. But generally, we know, we know how farming's, uh, how farming's confirmed, confirmed, and that's cool, because that says a lot in terms of the operation, and how many people might work there. What do the documents tell us? Look, it's a mixed bag, right? Before you get too excited. They tell us a lot, and they also tell us very little all at once. Confusing sort of mess with the documents, but I've done the best I can. Don't freak out when you see this next slide because it's got a lot of data on it. I'm gonna try to, I'll do the best I can to clarify it for you. Just don't start reading it all. I don't wanna see any reading glasses coming out, okay? All right, so I would have to put on mine if I was reading over this right now, I'm not. So just kind of focus on the, the uh, the simplified column names that I provided and the operation category. So between the documents, and there's really not that many documents, it looks like there are, they just confirm a lot of different operations, a lot of different enterprises um, in this operation among them, right? Between the documents, we know that there's various categories, operational categories, milling, distilling, various auxiliary enterprises, including blacksmithing confirmed archeologically, hog farming, animal butchery, et cetera, et cetera. Man. Quarters, living quarters, industrial household, workers quarters, and, uh, and other various other enterprises, textile production, and so on, right? This is a really exciting part of this list. The problematic part is not the justification. These are all the documents and archaeological facets that I used to justify the calls I made. It's this. It's the fact that if you look closely at any of these, these are the rooms that these operations could possibly be occurring in. For many of them, for example, malting, which is a part of the distilling, may or may not be a part of the distilling process. It's likely, but not necessary, not essential. Can happen in nearly any room or architectural feature and all of the second story, which we know really nothing about, right? So 
the documents are promising, but we're going to really have to ground truth this stuff. Otherwise, we won't be able to say much about how many people work there. We can say a lot about the operations we think that took place there, but not how many. Again, if I added oral histories to this, we'd have things like uh, um, hostel. We'd have things like uh, house of ill repute um, and various other things, which I'm just not sure about. I'm not sure what to do with them at this point. So I haven't, I haven't included them in this talk. But uh, so back to these research questions and NSF funded research and how Jews and Sarah and I are going to go after and answer these questions more specifically beyond what, we've, what, what I've excavated today, right? We're going to carry out architectural energetics work, which I've chosen to, of all the things that we're going to do, I'm going to give you a little bit more information on that, but nothing else really on this list. So experimental construction of segments of, uh, of the structure, right? Portions of the structure to see how long it took to build it. Answers research question one. Drone and LIDAR mapping. I'm not a LIDAR expert, right? But we're going to develop 3D models. Uh, so please send your questions to Jim Cesare at UC Berkeley. Uh, for LIDAR, but we're going to go uh, go forward with that mapping to develop a really nice 3D model to tell us something about construction, to tell us something potentially about day-to-day -day operations. Uh, GPR, ground penetrating radar, I'm not an expert in that either, that's you, please do, but I can walk, I'm a pedestrian, I can walk. <laughs> and total station survey, I will be uh, carrying out and have a pretty good sense of how we're going to do that, right? Answering all of our, or working toward answers for all of our research questions. Of course, excavation and artifact analysis with a special focus now that we have some money to do it on the East Wing. Money and personnel means we can start digging these deep holes that have to be pretty big because they've got to be so deep on the end to answering questions one, two, three. And then additional archival and oral historical research. I intend to send students out to places as far off as St. Louis to get archives related to Turley and the Turley family um, and Albuquerque um, and so on. There's lots of archival work to do. Oral historical work is probably going to be at the tail end. Um, of this research, uh, because I've done a lot of oral histories already, and I want oral histories to refine uh, the answers that we have, not, not necessarily create new questions right now. Right? So the architectural energetics piece, just the one of those uh, uh, solution, potential solutions to these research questions that I wanted to talk about, I'm most excited about this. So I'm the director of the Pacific Earth and um, Architecture Research Lab, which is actually a tiny room next door, right? I think it's the tiniest lab in the CSD system. I think that's, that's definitely the case. Um, so it's my architectural energetics lab, right? Uh, more of a storage room, but whatever. Um, we do experimental adobe production and construction uh, there. So we make adobes um, and we build usually these tiny little uh, adobe ovens to experiment with, kind of heat them up and so on. We're not doing that for this, but we're using the resources and experience behind the Pearl Lab, right? To bring Cal State East Bay, UC Berkeley and Taos High School students together and community, community volunteers together in making adobes, building small segments of what look like structure, doing some stone cutting, um, doing some woodworking, things like that, working with local experts to do it. Now, this is established, an established line of research, right? We're just going to be timing those steps, right? So we're going to follow our local guides. We're going to emulate what they do, work with them, right? And then time the steps. Once we get somewhat good at it, time our steps so we can have a sense for how long it took to build Turley's Mill, right? And like I said, this is established research. If you want to Google the Curry and Abrams, um, there is the definitive guide to architectural energetics now. What we want to produce is the statistics, something like this. Adobe bricks constructed in the Andean region. 1.1 meters squared worth of adobe bricks can be produced in a single person day. One person working eight hours, right? And there's the source. We want to be one of the sources on this list, essentially, and use this to answer our questions, too. So we calculated construction time based on those findings, right? Now, the Santa Cruz connection, finally, as promised, I hope I'm not... I'm not terrible in terms of time. I think I think I'm okay. Um, you, you'll let me know, Sam, if I am, of course, I imagine. So that the Santa Cruz connection, I've already given away, uh, we've already given away that it's Job Guy. Job Guy was Turley's foreman of construction, right? So between 1830 and 1831, he directed construction, presumably architected the site too. Job Guy was from Kentucky also. Any good Kentuckian at the time would know how to distill liquor, at the very least, how to produce a nice moonshine on the fly, right? And especially how to, how to create the hugely lucrative business of a mill distillery complex, right? Um, he arrived in Southern California in 1832, so not long after he left Taos. He just kind of skedaddled from Taos. He didn't want to stick around. Probably smart in that because he lived a very long life, unlike uh, Turley. He ended up on a grant known as Rancho Bayante, an area known as Rancho Bayante. He built his mill distillery complex there in 1835. Um, it's been probably six or seven years since I've researched it really heavily. Um, I was unable in that time to locate um, the mill distillery complex. There might be some of you eagerly raising your hands. I can't see your faces, but you might be eagerly raising your hands right now to tell me where it is. And I would love if that was the case. 
Uh, this is the point where somebody tells me something like, oh, it's at this park and my kids play, have played on it for years. That would be like great news. That would be music to my ears. But somehow I don't think it's going to be that easy. The operation was forced to close in 1840 for similar reasons to Turley's, except for it's kind of more of a standoff. This is oral history, though, right? Documented oral history. So I don't know where to, what to do with this either, but um, supposedly uh, Mexican authorities or Mexican neighbors, right, um, were a little bit perturbed by his operation for whatever reason um, and forced him to close it down, confiscating everything, right? That's as the, the oral history goes. I, I don't know where in Felton is. I, I suspect it's in Felton because of the overlap between Felton and, and historical Rancho Sayante, right? But I mean, all I know is from the very few documents and documented oral histories that I've read, I mean, it might be just outside of Felton. I really, I really don't know. And so whatever information that you could provide Judith and Sarah and I with, we'd be so grateful for that because I suspect we're gonna learn a lot about the construction of Turley's Mill by the construction of, uh, of, uh, of Joe Dye's uh, mill distillery complex. Right? And uh, also I'd like to know if his descendants are around today. If any of you know any of his descendants or can get a hold of any of Joe Dye's descendants, would love to talk to them, see if they have any information uh, to provide any, any oral history or lore um, in their family. And that's, that's what I'll end with. And I just want to say thank you again to, to the folks at the Santa Cruz Archaeological Society for helping me um, and to everyone else on this list and institutions at this point, because uh, I've had, as, I don't know, I mean, I've had at least 50 or 60 students there and probably the students and others, they have volunteers, probably broke 100 at this point. I have so many people who think it's impossible to do it on one slide. So thank you for having me and thank you to everyone uh, who's involved uh, in the past of this project. Yeah. <clears throat>